And uh, tonight we do a different series, a new series. And although I mentioned about the word prosperity, we're going to do prosperity for the Exodus. So it's very specific. Prosperity for the Exodus. And it ties with what we have touched on in the book of Revelations. And in terms of the end times, um, sometimes we say, you know, pastor, with all these things that come and go, you know, uh, prophets come, prophets go, uh, people come, people go. Do you still you believe all these end times things? Yes, because of experiences. Let me recount a few to encourage you. I've been transported in the midst of the altar buildings. And uh, so, and we were at that time working with the angels. And uh, people might say it's a subjective, but there were two other witnesses. And uh, the whole car also was transported about 100 ki kilometers. I know this move is real. And I know what God said is real. Plus, some of you have been in the October meetings and all that. And the October meetings have been based on visions, even of the second uh, thunder's uh, prophet. How can a blind man, who even if for a few seconds was totally healed, be totally healed based on obedience to the visions. Uh, even that he was also partially healed uh, towards that. Uh, and a lot of those things that we have experienced are too real to deny the reality of all the prophecies and the things that have come uh, to take place. On top of that, the main thing that motivates me is this is a realization that if Satan and the, Satan's Antichrist has truly been born last year. So 2015, sorry. Yeah, we just passed the 2017. In 2015, and the false prophet was born in 2004, and both are confirmed by two two prophets who are no more with us. By the first prophet, who prophesied the significance of 2015, and then uh, the same thunders prophet also that, if it is true, wow, we really had the back up. No matter how tough it is, we got the back up because the world does not know. And whoever has a privilege of that knowledge need to back up to get into the things of God to ensure that there is a force in the church that knows about that and that is ready to deal with that as the Antichrist and the false prophet grow. Uh, we need to grow proportionally even greater into the things of God. So just uh, think about those things and you realize, you know, uh, there are too many things too real to deny and that this move, and all that God has spoken of the moves, uh, has always been there. And it is a warning. And you can tell that Satan has fight tooth and nail in order to try to stop people being aware. And uh, I believe we are the only group alive today, together with those online, who truly believe the false prophet and the antichrist are already born. The majority of Christians are not aware. They are still living as if it's normal Christianity. And that is why we have, the, uh, we have to see ourselves the custodians of the move of God to bring this revelation forward and to go forward. And indeed, this year, being the fifth year of this move, is a year of increase and is in line with the message that we're preaching on prosperity for the Exodus. It's not just, it's not just uh, prosperity, it's prosperity for the Exodus. So let's look at the first Exodus. There's an Exodus that is coming. When people will have to be moved, uh, which we gather, let's say, 300 million strong from places that are in danger of the tsunami uh, destruction and earthquakes into refuge areas. That will be the great second exodus that is coming. 
So we look at patterns in the first Exodus. In the book of Genesis, chapter 15, when God first spoke about prosperity for Exodus in his covenant with Abraham. Now note the timing. Abraham was not, not looking for prosperity. Abraham was just interested to know from God what was uh, the promise of God in concerning his personal life. He wants a child. So if you turn to that, we go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you. Oh yes, thank you very much. All right, let me synchronize and as, as we pray. Father, we thank you for all your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father. We have experienced the work of the angels and they are too real to deny. We thank you, Father God, for the effects that the angels are doing upon this earth and all that is being done. And thank you, Father God, that you continue to raise up a group of overcomers who arise and become the messengers for this end time move. Thank you, Father God. We are not alone. We are 7,000 strong plus more, Lord, all over the world. People whose hearts are right before you. People who are ripe unto the harvest, who have not gone to the left or to the right, not compromised, O oh God, but have held on to your word and to the love of God, having first love for you. So Father, even as we come to this point of the move of God, as we see and proclaim this year as a year of increase, we thank you for all that you have established. Strengthen your people. Let your word go forth and stir all those to stand up and be among those to be counted in this end time move. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Okay, we have that up there. In Genesis 15, Abraham had a personal concern. And he says, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? Uh, and uh, he's praying to God for a child of his own. And then in the process of speaking to him, uh, fulfilling the promise, the first thing God did was cut a covenant with him. And then God told him about the future. How his descendants will be many and they will enter into the land of, uh, that they do not know, which we know to be the land of uh, Egypt. And then they will come forth from that. When they went into Egypt, they were about 70 souls. When they came out, there were 3 million of them approximately. That's uh, during, uh, within 400 years. And uh, in the midst of speaking to them about them coming out, God said in verse 14, Also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. That's something that Abraham did not ask for, did not expect. But God was talking about the prosperity that they will have when they come out. And that's prosperity for the Exodus that it talks about. Now, when we look at the Bible, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, 400 years have passed by. Now we have Moses. And uh, we start with Moses in the wilderness. He fled to the wilderness. Now he is about 80 years old and the time for, God, for the Exodus has come. Remember, prosperity for the Exodus is number one, predestined. It's been predestined 400 years before it took place. Which implies that the prosperity for Exodus 2 is also predestined. I will give you the scripture for that afterwards. It's far greater than this. But let's look at the predestination of that. God never mentioned it except He first have to call His man. And uh, some of the things that people do not understand is this. 
God does God you God does not just use organizations. I know organizations have been the way human beings organize themselves. But from Genesis to Revelation, God has always used human vessels. Not organization. Human vessels. So that sometimes you can uh, cast a person out of the organization. Let's say King Saul chased David out. The anointing was still on David. God has always used humans. I did not say that the humans are perfect. But the humans are those that God could find. The best that He could find in their generation. With flaws and all those things. God will always use humans. Human vessels. And if those human investors, two, three organizations, God will use those organizations. We need to know God's pattern. And that's something that sometimes people find it hard to stomach. But uh, it's been the pattern of God in the Bible. It's a pattern of God in church history. Methodism came after John Wesley died. But God started... And you remember when you, when you think about the great moves of God, you think about the people that were involved. Will's revival, even Roberts. First Great Awakening, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield. Second Great Awakening, Charles G. Finney. Although he started an organization and he had a great Bible school going, you remember the people. Because God works through people. So here God had to call Moses and prepare him. And finally, Moses was willing to answer the call. And at first, you can see the unwillingness of Moses to answer the call. But in the end, uh, he answered the call. And God did not say anything about the prosperity, which is the one we are zooming in. He just tells him to go and uh, set the people free. Uh, and... Um, in Exodus uh, chapter 4, he gave Moses a sign. Because Moses was just struggling and says in verse 1, Suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord says, What is that in your hand? He says, A rod. And he says, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. Moses fled from it. That's the first time it ever occurred uh, as far as he's concerned. And you've never seen that before. And then the Lord said, reach out uh, your hand and take it by the tail. He reached out, caught it, it became a rod in his hand. And um, then he had the second sign of the leprous hand. And um, then he also has a sign uh, of the blood, which is found in verse 9. And after those signs, Moses still was trying to get out of his call. And Moses said, uh, I'm not a good speaker. Uh, that one, God really almost rebuked him and says, You know, who has made man's mouth? Uh, who, who makes the mute, deaf, seeing, blind? Am I not the Lord? Go, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And then the finale came when Moses said, Please send somebody else. That one, God really, ups God really was not pleased. In verse 14, God was angry. He find excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. And then uh, God said, Do you know that Moses was predestined? Correct? He was a baby already predestined. But predestination is still subject to free will. Moses could say he doesn't want. And uh, can you see the free will is struggling? The soul is still struggling with the predestination. And... Uh, in the end, uh, God was angry at him. He said, send somebody else. And God said, no, no, you still got to go, but I'll let you use your brother. That all those things were not in God's original plan. But God would put up with it. Remember, it was Moses later on in the book of Numbers who say, I cannot carry the people. Then God said, okay. Uh, because he says, I will, uh, kill me. When he says, kill, kill him, God said, I will take the anointing from you and put it on 70 people. Remember, you may be predestined, but free will 
will never be violated. You can say, choose to say, I will, Lord. And I learn to say that all the time. And uh, then you learn from the past, you learn from the Bible. And uh, sometimes you see all those things happening, and then you feel like saying, Oh Lord, you know, like you almost like Elijah say, I'm all alone, but no, you know. So, so uh, recently I've been telling the Lord, Thank you, Lord, for the 7,000 who are hidden all over the place. <laughs> and uh, there's always a sign, Let the 7,000 stand up strong, because uh, they're always there. Because Elijah thought he was alone, and God says, I actually have 7,000 more. So remember, there are those whose hearts God has prepared all over the world. This message has gone all over the world. And so anyway, Aaron was uh, included uh, and, uh, as his assistant. Uh, Moses was still the girl. God never said anything about prosperity. Because it was not time yet. And you know the... Notice when God starts talking about prosperity. And uh, when you look uh, to the first encounter with, with Pharaoh in chapter 5, and of course it was a failure. It was a failure because when you say, let my people go, Pharaoh, make, they want to let them go and make their, their task harder. In fact, the people were upset. Everyone was upset because it looks like a failure. Uh, and they said, you know, uh, we, are not, we are not free yet. Pharaoh is now upset. And then now we're going to gather the straw for the bricks. And before the straw was provided, now we're going to work twice as hard. We're going to source out the material and also work with the material. Uh, and uh, when that took place... Uh, the children of uh, Israel and the elders in verse 20 came to Moses and said, they, as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron, who stood there to meet them. Then they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill. Now we're going to work twice as hard. And then Moses was also upset. He was 22. Moses says, He returned to the Lord and he prayed. Why have you brought trouble on these people? Why is it that you sent me? Since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to these people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. So Moses was also discouraged. And in the end chapter 6, the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now God knew he, what he was going to do all the time. But he let, ne, need to let the humans play their role. And finally, he reveals to Moses in verse 2. He says, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham and all those as El Shaddai. And uh, then he says, I come to fulfill the covenant. To bring great judgment. Uh, here on the people and he says I will rescue you from the bondage I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment I will take you as my people and I will be your God then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians so God began to talk about the methodology by which He was going to bring prosperity upon them. Nobody know, not even Moses, that it was going to take ten plagues. Ten plagues before prosperity came. But when they came out, as you know, in the Exodus, when they came out in the great exodus, they had all the wealth of Egypt before them. That's in Exodus chapter 14. And, um, I jump to chapter 14. That's where the Red Sea crossing. Now just one day before that, just one day before that, just before uh, the Passover feast was given, 
before the last plague that was there, God told them exactly what to do. Uh, he gave the covenant of the Exodus and uh, tell them what to do. Uh, let's say we have here, okay, here is chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterwards, you will, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here together. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor, every woman from his neighbor, articles of silver, articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servant, in the sight of the people. So literally, they plundered Egypt. Remember the prophecy, Genesis 15. They will come up with great possession. But before they had great possessions, they were like slaves. And slaves work for nothing. But God caused them to prosper in a mighty way. And they came up with the prosperity in the Exodus. We all know the story very well. All that I'm recounting is just history to every one of you. In the first point, prosperity for the Exodus is predestined. Look at the book of Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. I see Isaiah chapter 60 as the prophecy of prosperity, not just for the nation of Israel who will have their own separate blessing, but it refers to the Exodus. The Exodus that God prophesied. That's hidden somewhere in the Bible. It's just like uh, the year 2029, the tsunami, is hidden in the Bible. It's hidden in the book of Hebrews 12. It's hidden in the book of Habakkuk. Remember God says, yet one more time I will shake the earth. But we don't realize that it was a literal one and how great the shaking was going to be. But both the shaking and uh, the exodus are tied together. The destruction that is coming and God has to save His people. In Isaiah chapter 60, how do we know it's tied to the Gentiles? It talks about the Gentiles. And in all the prophecies that we've seen, from now to the year of the rapture, to the time of the rapture, there is no place where Israel will become Isaiah 60. There is no place. From now to 2029, Israel will not be great. It will be an influence, but it will never rise to like what it was in the time of David physically. In fact, after that, the, after uh, 2029, the nations that will rise up will be Russia and China. And they will dominate until the end of the Gentile age. There's no place in the end time prophecy that show forth Israel dominating all the nations of the world. Like David in his earthly kingdom in Israel that dominate all the nations around. So you may ask, why? Because that domination is given to the church. The new Jew, whom Paul says that uh, there are Jews who are not really Jews. And he talked about the circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. Because that domination has been given to the church. And when the church rises to the place where it dominates the works of Satan, prosperity flows forth. When the decree of the Ancient of Days is fully realized, 
when it says that the saints, it's time for the saints to possess the earth. That is tied to Acts, uh, Isaiah chapter 60. So we see here in verse 1 and 2, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light. Kings of the brightness of your rising. Leave up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Notice the gathering together. That's the Exodus that is being prophesied. Exodus 2, that the Bible talks about. Uh, and uh, it will never happen in, uh, in Israel. Although in Israel they have uh, a typology of many people returning to Israel. But Israel will never be. In the end time prophecy, they never again will be a great nation. In fact, from the end time prophecy, we know that they are not going to be able to build their temple. And up to now they can never... Because sitting right there is a different building. And then we know that around the years uh, 2055, when the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, began to enter into the area of Israel, that they're going to build a different temple. The temple built by the Antichrist. And he will create another building and he will call the two domes of peace the due domes of peace. It will be for all the religions of the world to unite all the religions of the world. It won't be Judaism. That's what we know. So there's no place at all that, that the Israelite third temple will be ever built or their sacrifices and offerings of the Old Testament will ever be restored. From what we know, it will never happen. It will never happen. There's no place in all the seven times, seven years that it ever happened. So, it looks like Isaiah 60 will never happen. But it will happen in the church. What other clues do we have that it refers to the church? You look towards the end part of it. In between, of course, you look at the massiveness of the prosperity. Look at verse 14. It talks about Zion. And Zion is in typology... New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem, by typology, is the church. You could go from one to the other. Zion refers to, in spiritual typology, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, the church. Paul himself says, in Hebrews 12, we have come to Mount Zion. Then in one breath, in the same words in chapter 12, he says, New Jerusalem. And then when you look into the book of Revelation, New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ goes to Ephesians chapter 5, the church. Very logical sequence. And then we come back to Isaiah chapter 60, and it says, also the sons of those who afflict you, because the church has been going through persecution all the time, shall come bowing to you. And all those who despise you shall fall prostrate your feet, at the soles of your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord. Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So there will be a time, a short time, in the midst of the seven times seven years, when the church will possess the kingdoms of the world. A short time. Just short enough to do God's work. You say, why not long enough? It is just to do God's work. Because I can tell you this. History has shown that humans cannot handle power and wealth for long. The first generation might be able to handle it. But when that first generation die, the second generation starts going astray. Look at Joshua. It started well. Look at the next generation after that. Look at the story of the book of Judges. And look at church history. And look at our modern church history. 
once prosperity, power and wealth come, the original generation that had paid the price, the original generation that understood the cost and the blood, sweat and tears it takes to get success, they will handle it well. But the generation that does not taste blood, sweat and tears and they inherit success, already flaws will start coming. So in the time of great prosperity, by predestination, it will come fast and quick. And it will be for a time. Just for the exodus. And that's when it is important to invest it for the exodus. In order to do what God wants to do. And notice everybody was blessed in the first exodus. Every woman and every man and every servant or man servant asked their neighbors. So they got a lot of things. And they were supposed to enter into the wilderness and be blessed with what they have, keep what they want, but bless the work of the building of the tabernacle. And that was what they were supposed to do, and they did faithfully. And that's how you get all the gold and the silver that was there to build the tabernacle of uh, Moses and the ark. And they got all their resources that were there. Because God blessed every single one of them. So the Exodus has been predestined. Isaiah 60 is prophesying the prosperity of the exodus that the prosperity for the exodus that will come upon the people of god and it will begin if we walk faithfully this year it will begin the increase this year we have only a few years to the years of prosperity and then there's the years of famine where there's prosperity still and you're going to prosper in the remaining years of prosperity up to 2020 and during the famine. Because the, there is other scripture. Joseph and the Israelites prosper during the famine. During the famine. And Isaac, who is a typology of Christ, Abraham was a type of the father. Jacob or Israel was a type of the spirit. Isaac was a type of Jesus. And showing the inheritance of God. Isaac prospered in a time of famine. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. To show Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And there is prosperity still in a time of famine. So there is this due prosperity in a time of the years of prosperity and then a second level of prosperity in a time of the famine. There's a due prosperity going on. And this is prophesied in the Bible and that is why the Lord has these stories that are there for we enter into the final thing of the earth. After these seven times, seven years, there's no more human history. I mean, there is the tribulation and all that. Uh, there, there's no human history like we have. That's the finale. So all the Bible stories and all the Bible incidences point to this great prosperity for the Exodus that is coming forth. And I know some of you are looking at your wallets and pocket and say, Bole. And looking at your life around and say, How? That's why it's going to take a great work of God to bring it forth. And notice, when God spoke about prosperity to Abraham, He talk about prosperity even in a time when they were oppressed for 400 years and then they come out and the same way 
when he spoke about that. It's a very supernatural prosperity. But you have one verse that begin to tell the pattern. So we look at this area here. Uh, prosperity for the Exodus has been prophesied. Now, let me just read the other verses that are tied to all these things together to the time of the, the need for the Exodus. Hebrews chapter 12, very quickly. Hebrews chapter 12, and Paul says, Paul says here, In verse 22, Hebrews 12, 22. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So he says, here come to Mount Zion. And he's talking about the church. He's not talking about Israel anymore. This is Paul. And Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, new Jerusalem. Then he says, notice it's just before the shaking. And he says, in verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And then he talked about the shaking that is about to come. And that's where we realize that it is both a physical and a spiritual shaking. And that last thing is in uh, 2029. It's prophesying. Turn to Haggai also, chapter 2. And uh, verse 6, and, uh, okay, Haggai 2, 6, okay, let me get to the full verse, Haggai 2, verse 6, where, okay, oh, I look at back up. Okay, Haggai, there you go. Haggai 2, verse 6. It says, Thus says the Lord, and this is the same verse repeated in the Hebrew chapter 12, that I will shake heaven and earth one more time. And you notice that uh, in the same breath, he talked about two things. It says in verse 7, I will shake all nations, they shall come to the desire of all nations, and that is Christ Jesus. I will fill this temple. The temple doesn't refer to a physical building. It refers to we are the temple of God. Based on Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and 3. We are the temple. This temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Then notice he says, The silver is mine. The gold is mine. Why does he talk about prosperity? Because... As I mentioned, just as Abraham had a predestination of prosperity for his descendants, for the first Exodus, we have our verses for the prosperity for Exodus 2. In line with this shaking, God is going to take all the silver and the gold. And all the wealth, all the world. I say, there is mine. And tell the devil, get your hands off. They belong to my people. And just as God stripped it from the Egyptians, which represent the worldly people, Egypt will always represent the world, and put it into the hands of His people, that ties with the scriptures that many people claim the wealth of the sinner will, enter into the, will come to the hands of the righteous. You all know those verses, right? So I don't want to turn to that. Now, the verses that say that the wealth of the sinner will come into the hands of the righteous, is also indirectly pointing to the Exodus 2. Because when does it change hands? Especially for the Exodus. You have the actual physical transaction in Exodus 1. After all the judgments of God. 
and the Israelites demanded or asked from the Egyptians, well, and they got it. So I need to cover a very strong ground. That you don't just think that Isaiah 60 is the place where you prophesy prosperity. Haggai chapter 2. It speaks about that. And um, that's why it's tied to the silver and the gold that God claims for himself. And then the verses where the word of the sinner will come into the hands of the righteous, that is also indirectly prophesying about the Exodus. Where God will strip it from all those who are not worthy to handle it and put it into your hands. It's going to come forth in that. Plus more verses, but the other verses we're going to consider is this. That in the time of Joseph, all the wealth of Pharaoh came under the Israelite control. At least Joseph. And the Israelites in the land of Egypt prosper. Prosper. Joseph took control of all the prosperity and they became even more prosperous in the years of the famine. In the second year, after two years of famine, then his family all joined him. And, and we know the rest of the story, how they multiplied that. The prosperity for Exodus has been prophesied. From Exodus 1 to Exodus 2, that's going to take place from the years 2022, approximately, to the year 2026 and 27. After the year, then there will be the war years from 2027 onwards, then the tsunami in 2029. Uh, after the tsunami, we will still pick up some refugees here and there. But the bulk of the Exodus takes place from 2022 to 2026. And God is going to raise the money. God is going to prosper people so powerfully, supernaturally, that they say, wow, this is really the hand of God. Which you just saw point one is predestined. There's nothing that can stop it. Predestined means it's going to happen whether you like it or not. Your only decision is whether you're going to be part of that. See, when something is predestined, your only decision is am I going to be part of it by free choice? You can be part of it or you might not be part of it. It's going to happen anyway. And it's our free choice to decide you want to be part of it. Now when we decide and are ready and willing to be part of it, we set it in our heart. What does it take to be part of it? Of course, a consecrated heart. God has to be, God has to test us. And it always will be the three, the three G's, the three W's, the three F's, you know, all those things. You'll be tested whether you can handle power and fame. You'll be tested whether you can handle money. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the first thing he says is about mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Your ability to handle money. Uh, as I said, sometimes people who, you know, you, you think that people are doing well, doing well, doing well, and then suddenly they don't, don't do well. Of course, the third is in terms of desires of the flesh, lusts and all those things. We must be able to handle all three things. And 
everyone whom God wants to qualify to be part of those who can handle that will have to be tested and proven in different ways. But the main gist of how these things are going to take place, look back, and we already covered point one on the, it's been, it's been predestined. Prospective for the expert is already predestined. It will definitely happen. Whether we are part of it is the question. Which comes to point two. How do we become a part of it? Which is the part you're more interested in? The first part, you know, convincing is in the Bible, that's the easy part. Second part, how do I become a part of that? Thank you for asking the silent questions, which you know you can ask questions, by the way. This is Bible study. Look over uh, at the book of uh, Exodus. Again, I believe we were around chapter 11. In verse 2, when God says, Let everyone go and ask for silver and gold. What is silver and gold specially mentioned? Verse 3, The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And there you have that word, favor. And it's not an ordinary favor. It says, it's grace. The Old Testament word for favor. God gave the people favor. God did something in their lives so that the favor of God is upon them. Now look at this favor operating in the time of Joseph. In the book of Genesis, Genesis 11, we see uh, Joseph, as he stood before Pharaoh, so let's go forward a few chapters. I believe should, chapter 40 should cover it. 41. Pharaoh had a dream. And um, then the butler remember Joseph. And then when Joseph interpreted the dream and suggested something, in verse 37 to 39, the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? In other words, he found favor in Pharaoh's eyes. Pharaoh said, this is a man I want to employ. But Joseph had developed his favor through four stages. Four stages. The first stage was in chapter 37. So the favor developed in all these four stages. In chapter 37, when he was just young and 17 years old. In verse 3, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Now this was natural favor. Natural favor. Because when favor comes from God, it works out in the natural also. As you know, in scientific terms, they have tested humans. Some humans are better looking than others in the natural. And out in the street, when uh, you talk to strangers, people judge you by your outward appearance. If you look like a mafia and say, hello, what people run. <laughs> right? If you look like a friendly person and someone... But let's say if someone needs help or direction, out of the crowd, how many times do they come to you? <laughs> Every time? Because they will look at your face. They say, who can I approach? And then out of the crowd, they might choose you. Because 
They don't know you, they don't know your name. It's all outward appearance. Inward favor will have an outward thing, and some people have an outward thing. Unfortunately, and of course, don't do that when you have 12, 12 kids, you know, love all your kids equally. Joseph loved Joseph above all because that was the only woman he had loved and wanted to marry. Remember that? Jacob and Rachel. He didn't want to marry Leah. The father-in-law got him into that. And he didn't expect the other two maid servants. He was only emotionally involved with one. And that one died on the way out. So, it was all in a natural sense. Of course, now it is his favorite son. The one that came from the woman he had originally loved. Remember how much he loved Rachel? Worked seven years, feel like a few days. That must be some powerful love story. Right? So in a movie, it will be like, sun go up, sun go down, sun go up, sun go down, sun go down, all finished. Seven years, three days. It was natural favor which does not last. Which does not last. Now, if you were in a position of Joseph, remember you can ask your questions, you're 17 years old, still inexperienced in life, and you got all this favor when Papa come home or when Papa does something, he give you all the best, then you give the life over to all the other brothers. Then you feel bad. If I were there, I would feel bad. And I will go, probably go and share with all the others too. So you have one story, and that one story is, I can tell you, that's not the only time he favored him. But that's the one time that was critical to the story. If he had bought chocolates, if they were chocolates in those days, or nuts, uh, oh yeah, they would have eaten, mon uh, not macadamia, I was going to say macadamia, pistachio nuts. Uh, would have been in those days there, pistachio nuts or whatever nuts, why walnuts for you? Alright, whatever thing, Joseph would have all the best. And maybe, you know, all the nice parts of the steak and all that, the brother get all the bones, whatever, you know, it's not a nice thing happening at home. Natural favor is never fair. It's never fair. And here's what I believe. Joseph didn't know how to handle that favor. Too young, too inexperienced. And that favor, which you might, you might say, I, it cannot help that the father likes him. But you can help share all your things. And he made his brothers more angry. Uh, and in verse 4, his brother saw that the father loved him more than all his brothers and they hate him. They already hate him. They don't like him. On top of that, he speak bad about them. I don't think he's handling his favor well. He could not handle favor well. It was not just favor. The negative part of this type of natural favor is called favoritism. We should never be practiced by any of us. Favoritism. We should deal with people based on meritocracy. The merits of each person. Favoritism. It was a wrong type of favor. And here he tastes of it. That nearly killed him. That first stage. So if you think favor equals favoritism, get ready to be killed. He couldn't handle it. Couldn't understand it. And he lived a privileged life. 
Yes. Yes, correct. Correct. But can compensate, but it overdone. Overdone. And in the end, he lost everything. Everything was taken away from him. So, stage one, natural favor is not the right kind of favor. You don't rely on natural favor. Your looks, your natural inheritance, name calling, and all those natural favor, we have to learn, they do not last. It did not bring him into prosperity, it brought him into poverty. And um, then, you see the other story that we jump ahead since we're focused just on the prosperity part. Uh, there's an interlude between the story of Judah and Tema, but let's look at chapter 39. Joseph had been, ch chapter 39, verse 1, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites. So he was sold at the slave market and he was bought. Imagine, now just a slave. And uh, it says in verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Do you see the word favor again? This is stage two favor. Now this stage two favor, he has learned. He has learned. And this stage two favor comes because of the Obed Edom effect. Remember the Ark of the Covenant and everything was prospering? It was Obed Edom. The master looked at him. Hmm. Everywhere Joseph went, everything Joseph did prospered. Isn't it Obed Edom effect? That means uh, when the Ark of God was in Obed Edom's house, Obed Edom's house prospered. For three months, and then, Joseph, uh, then David says, I, I want that thing, bring the ark. Because he stopped bringing the ark because uh, Uzzah died on the way. The Obed Edom effect was taking place. You're beginning to see now that we need the Obed Edom effect. But the Obed Edom effect doesn't come overnight. People need to see that the Lord is with you. Look at, before the word favor was mentioned, it was, the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. Uh, the word successful is actually from the word salah or salich, which actually has been translated prosperous man. That means, and you might like the word prosperity, because the word prosperity in Hebrew salah or salich means to keep moving forward. Ah, keep moving forward. And it's been translated here as the word success. The word success and the word prosperity are the same words. If you succeed, you're prosperous, you're prosperous, you succeed. And both words, both Hebrew words, are actually the same Hebrew word, translated differently. The gist of the Hebrew word for prosper or success means to move forward. And here I want to encourage you. Even if you fail, you get up and move forward, you succeed. Based on the Hebrew word. So as long as you're moving forwards, not backwards or sidewards, that's important. To succeed, 
All it takes is for you to take one more step forward. Sometimes it is easy to walk. Oh, okay. I found a pen down here. Sometimes it is easy to walk. But sometimes taking one step is tough. Especially when there's a wind against you. Or you're slowly trying to walk forwards. But as long as you're going forward, based on the Hebrew word salah, salich, you already are successful. Each step you take is a success. Make sure that your step is not sideways. Remember, the Bible always says, don't turn to the left or to the right, or to go backwards. What was wrong with the first generation that came out from Egypt? They always want to go back. So they fail. They fail because they always want to go back. Burn your bridges. Nothing to go back to. I burned my bridge long, long ago. And your love stock bearer committed to the move. Which is why I say, if everybody fails, I'll still be there. Because this move is too important. We're talking about things that, this, that have to hold back the Antichrist and the false prophet. And it is important that we have this kind of commitment. Commitment unto death. Of course, for us, it's commitment unto life. And that commitment will be tested. And the Hebrew word is to move forward. Now you think about it. If Joseph was a modern human, he would need a lot of counseling. <laughs> he got a lot of reasons not to move forward. Correct? He could be a slave that is a miserable slave. Always dreaming of what he had. After all, he was a wealthy son. Strip naked, sold as a slave, having nothing. Right to the bottom of the ladder. Cannot go lower than that because a slave doesn't even own himself. Bought and sold like a piece of meat. That's all he is. He could have a lot of unforgiveness. So if you have unforgiveness holding you back, unforgiveness is this. Let me tell you the gist of unforgiveness. I know unforgiveness could be a feeling, hurts and all those things, but let me tell you what the gist of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness based on what we are teaching is looking back. Correct? Unforgiveness is starting to do with your past, right? except it's an unpleasant past that you cannot get over, that you cannot stop forgetting, that you cannot stop remembering, even if it's sometimes five years back, ten years back, twenty years back. Bitterness, same thing. Remember the root of bitterness, the semen was won again. That stopped his Christian life from progressing. Bitterness doesn't have someone to unforgive, but bitterness is a memory of something painful in the past that you cannot get over. Now remember, these things will rob you of success, salah, salih, moving forward. So if you're not moving forward means you're moving round and round. Around your past. It looks like you're moving forward, but then you were round your past again. Then you were round your past again. You need to 
forget. The blood of Jesus cleanses you. Move forward. Yes. Ah, yeah. it, we must be able to remember it without the pain. Because we humans have memories. Ah. And then the second thing, remember without the pain, the second thing is how often we think about it and occupy our thought life. If our thought life is 70% or 90% thinking about past things, How will you move forward? If you could analyze all your thoughts and you ask, how much of it is about some one event in the past or two events in the past? How much of it is about the future? You can never reach the future without visualizing the future. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of God that produces, that creates spiritual and physical reality. It's something that's not there yet. And success or prosperity is moving forward. So, at stage two, I believe Joseph learned to move forward. I'm sure he still got feelings. Because remember when his brother came, he cried. I remember long ago when I was young and my mother used to tell stories of the war, Second World War that they've been through. Most of us were born you know, outside the Second World War, after the Second World War. You could still see the tears and the pain that when they share things. I mean, it's a reality to them. The most important thing is, don't let it occupy the major point of your life and get touched by God so that the pain of it has disappeared. Joseph went through a traumatic time, betrayed by his brothers, lost his privilege life. He could spend the rest of his time just doing slave work and quickly go, go back to his quarters and pine for the good old days. He could have done that. But instead, he just kept doing whatever God asked him to do. And he was a person conscious of God. And the Bible says here, the Lord was with him and then in verse 3, the master saw that the Lord was with him and that everything he did, there was a God who prospered him. That's called the obey Edom effect. And that's how he found favor. The second stage, favor, he has mastered it. It was through the presence of God. Don't give God up. Hold on to God. Hold on to whatever God has spoken. For Joseph, he has two dreams. I'm sure it might come to him. Here he is at the bottom of the ladder. And the dream was he was at the top of the ladder. Isn't it interesting that sometimes when you receive a prophecy from God, you expect it to be fulfilled the way it should be, but you seem to be on the opposite direction. <laughs> the two dreams reveal he will go higher. But reality actually put him lower. He is now a slave and not a ruler. But don't give up. He never gave God up. He remembered the God of his father. That was his salvation. Because if the Lord is with you, who can be against you? Think about that. 
The most important thing in life is to do God's will. And remember, doing God's will is the only place you can please God. To be in the center of God's perfect will pleases God. And doing God's will pleases Him. And when God is with you as you do His will, who can be against you? Just rest in the Lord, your God. So stage two, how did he find favor? By being with the Lord and the Lord being with him. And you all know the principle. For the Lord to be with him, he must be with the Lord. Didn't the Bible say, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you? So you saw the second part, God drawing near to him, correct? He must have done the first part, he drew near to God. Implied, obviously. Every principle the Bible tells us, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. He that seeketh God, God will seek after you. His eyes look to and fro to those who seek Him. It's in the book of Psalms, in the book of James, always, those who seek the Lord, God shows His presence. So we see the second part, God drawing near to Him, is because He drew near to God. So stage two, he understood. Natural favor is like a flower that comes and dies. Doesn't last. Don't rely on natural flavor. Favor. Rely on God's favor. And stage two, he realized this presence is work out every day. Because for the master to see him, there is a time process. Where well, you think overnight he got favor? No. The master must have enough time to see him do th things. And the master must have enough time, time must have passed, so that the master could see that whatever he did, prosper. Whenever Joseph was involved in anything, that part of his business prospered. He called another slave, it didn't work out. Called Joseph, it worked out. So there must be enough events collected for the master to conclude there is a God who is looking after this man Joseph and whatever he did, he prospers. So there must be enough experience, events and months or weeks or, or even a year or so to pass by before the master had that. So Joseph faithfully seek God. Never gave God up faithfully walk with God and allow God to show Himself until people could see that God is with Him. When people see that God is with you, the Obed-Edom effect starts operating. Stage 2. You say, wow, stage 2 already so good. Not good enough. Stage 3. Now, Joseph was a good-looking man in verse 6. He was handsome in form and appearance. Here comes Mrs. Potiphar. And Mrs. Potiphar wanted to do something wrong. Joseph was so blessed. You know how much favor he had? He says, in uh, verse 5, when he found favor, Potiphar made him overseer of his house, all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus, he left all in Joseph's hand. And he did not know what, he, what, what was going on anymore. Everything was just so hand. All he has was, okay, I'm getting the blessing here. He, the bread I eat, the food I eat. All Joseph is taking care of everything. Joseph was like his businessman now. He doesn't even need to do anything. He just get the blessings because of Joseph. <clears throat> he trusted Joseph. Left everything to Joseph. <clears throat> and Joseph was faithful. Never abused, never misused. And Mrs. Potiphar 
also wants to do something else. And Joseph keep avoiding her, avoiding her, until one fine day. And according to, in the Bible, you only see this story once, correct? According to Josephus, Josephus, you read Josephus, uh, Jewish history, Antiquities of the Jews, check the section on Joseph, Every day, every day she would say, Joseph, Joseph. Even later on when he was forced in prison, according to Josephus, she visited him. Joseph! I tell you, she really going after him. And so Joseph's Favor has to be tested. Because when favor brings you wealth, power, opportunities for all kinds of pleasure, you be tested whether you will cross the line. You be tested whether you will cross the line. He is given a chance, but Joseph did not cross the line. By not crossing the line and being faithful unto God, he was falsely accused. And uh, when he was falsely accused, in verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison. So, from favorite son, favorite slave become prisoner <laughs> because he's need stage three favor. He said, why? Why is stage two not enough? Stage two favor was based on faithfulness. If you're faithful, you're diligent and he's a hardworking person and you pray, God will be with you. But stage three favor is called powerful favor. Say, why powerful? Because you must have favor in a place where no favor is. Favor in prison. Among the worst criminals. Favor with the jailers. Who looks at you like, oh, you're one of those prisoners. After all, some people might believe the false accusation. So, the third level of favor is very powerful. It's called powerful favor. Because you must find favor where it's impossible to find favor. So some of you are put in difficult places. And you say, why did God put me here? To develop stage 3 favor. Why? For the Exodus. For the Exodus. Where it's difficult to find favor, you still will do what you want and still get the favor there. Nobody have, heard, have done this before. Everything that Joseph did in stage 2, other people might have done. Right? They work hard. Their work is recognized. They got some sort of blessing on their life. And people say, well done, good and faithful servant. After all, you got the, the five talent guy and the two talent guy. But nobody is favored in prison. And that's what Joseph developed. Do you know as a prisoner, becoming in charge of the whole prison, where you got the keys to look through everything, and you don't escape yourself, there's favor! Where at the end of the day, because you're a prisoner, you lock yourself in. The jailer trusts him so much, and say, here are the keys. 
Favor that is impossible. It says here, he is in prison, he was 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor. And this one was different. This one, the favor come from the front. It gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And you know what the keeper of the prison did? The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners, the whole prison, the keys, everything. Remember, he visited them one by one. He has the keys. Impossible favor. Can you see the favor here is different level? It's a different level of favor. It's powerful favor. It's the possibility favor in an impossible place. When you can succeed in a place like the prison, you know what it says of you? You can succeed anywhere. So like for example, people plant churches here and there or here and there. It's a different thing to plant a church in Singapore, you plant a church in US, or plant a church in Canada. Let's say you're supposed to plant a church in Iran. As opposed to India. Of course, it will take skills and take knowledge to do that. But suppose you are successful in planting a church in a very impossible place. You know what will become? Even if the church is small, you have something in you that nobody has. Because the more impossible and you can still succeed, there is move forward. Something is powerful in you. Because God needs to raise us up to the level where we have impossible favor. But because I don't like the word impossible, I got to put the word powerful favor. Closest I can find. You can find another word, I'll find it. Extreme. Extreme sometimes can be good, can be bad. But powerful is always good. Uh, anyway, in a, in a good sense. Powerful favor. A favor that keeps you from being killed in prison was not good enough. You're in charge of the prison. And you yourself are a prisoner. Impossible! Correct! The situation is impossible! But yet, it was possible as long as God is with you. So the Obed Edom effect took greater. Like for example, we know when God starts working signs and wonders and He deals with impossible miracles, something is there. Or, let's say the Obed Edom effect come on you, that even if you got a desert as a land, it prosper. You say, what well, that one takes normal. When someone who just had a piece of land and then they plant and prosper, and you got a desert and you prosper, something is more here. That is what I call stage three favor that God can give you. So if you're in any situation that's impossible, now you know why after stage three, you will realize that between now and 2022, we've got a lot of time. Whereas, if you don't understand what God can do, you thought not enough time. Yes. Six years. Six years. Okay, not too bad. Six years to have all the wealth of the world. All the wealth. Isn't Isaiah 60 the whole world of the world? Impossible, even in the natural. But with God, all things are possible. And I choose, Father, to believe it is possible. Because, point number one, it's been predestined. 
Wasn't it impossible for them to come out with possession? Yes. It has been predestined and you cannot run from that. All you want to make sure, we're going to answer that question, you're going to make sure you have the right mark on your forehead. Not the enemy one. God's mark on you. So that God says, you're one of those chosen to handle that well. Yes. That's it. Uh, yes. But God has done a lot of working. Which is why in this series, I'm going to talk about a certain thing. Like you already noticed. Even before Joseph stood before Pharaoh, there were gifts. There were certain things. And that's the details we'll look at. That's why we focus on prosperity for the Exodus. Uh, but today we managed to do two points. One is, it's been predestined. Second point, favor in four stages. Four stages. Not everybody is chosen to do favor at stage three. Because some people got only stage two, and that's all they can handle. So some people are blessed by God today. Some people are used by God, and they're prosperous. But if they cannot get into stage three favor, they will never see the prosperity of the exodus. There'll be so much silver and gold you cannot count. I could imagine a time of prosperity when all the wealth of the world is being handled. You might have never seen so many zeros and figures in your life. The word trillion might even be too small. Remember, you're moving 300 million people. And the money is not just to move them. To move them already might be trillions of dollars. To own the places that they move to. 300 million people is the size of uh, the population of Europe or USA. That's a lot of people and a lot of wealth. Who will this prosperity go to? Those who have been tested stage 3 favor. And you go to dig deep into the presence of God to get that favor out. How do you think Joseph felt when he was in prison? It was like, you know, his life was, was there, and then he fell down, boom, so as a slave. Then he was climbing up again, climbing up again, climbing up again, and then, boom, down again. How would you feel? As long as you have God, you're still all right. So whatever happens in your life, the most important thing, check. Is God still here? Is God still inside? Is God still with me? Am I still in God? If the answer is yes, 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 hallelujah, you're all right. Even if you have abandoned, make sure it's not God who abandons you. So as God is there, stage three took many years. And in prison, you got limited number of people. It's not like, you know, as a slave out there in charge of business, you got interaction, social thing, you find loneliness, and then some of the prisoners might not be nice people. And, but Joseph cared for them. He took care of every one of the prisoners like his own family. He loved people, obviously. You can see how he cared for the butler and the baker. Because they were new prisoners, he, was, he must have been doing prisoner visitation. Can you imagine? Prisoner, do prisoner ministry, visitation. He must have visited that because they are new prisoners. And so the next day, which is, remember the first day they got a dream. 
So the next day he was there visiting them. He was in charge. He cared for them. To care of them. Favor, stage three. By the time he has got through stage three, stage four, he stood before Pharaoh in chapter 41. Pharaoh recognized he was not an ordinary man. Says in verse 37, he saw that the advice was good in the, in the eyes of Pharaoh, in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servant in Genesis 41 verse 38, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, over my people, and all my people shall be rule according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. He rose up to be the number one under Pharaoh. The highest place he can be. His dreams have come true. Now notice, it is not just favor now. Stage four. He literally saw that God is with him, the Spirit of God. By stage four, the Spirit being, Agurelial, had operated so much in his life until he and the Spirit being were like one. He could on the spot give advice what to do. So you see the amount of stage four favor. Stage four favor is they don't just see the favor. They saw the spirit behind the favor. And at that stage, he recognized the spirit of God was here. Is here. Is on this person. And on a spot, you see such favor? Do you know that that's the first time Pharaoh saw him? First time he saw him. And so much favor, he trusts him with the entire country. The entire country was given to him. Look at how powerful the favor is. Because something came out from stage three. He has grown into the fullness. And we all know one thing. He was predestined to be there. When you are predestined in some things, you could be knocked two, three times or a thousand times. But when your time has come, your time has come and nothing can stop it. That's why prosperity for the Exodus is the most powerful prosperity that not even all the fine teaching of prosperity that has brought prosperity to all the people who are walking with the Lord can compare to that which is coming in the prosperity for the Exodus. It will look like all the prosperity that the church has today, like peanuts. It's a great, powerful place to be. And we need to line up with God's predestination and say like Isaiah, send me, Lord. I'll be a part of it. But remember, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. At stage four, when you have been proven and well trained, that's when it comes in its fullness. In one day, entire countries surrender to you. Talking about countries, there are hundred over countries, entire countries. 
That's how great a favor can come. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we pray that we may understand this concept of prosperity for the Exodus. When you declare at the great shaking, when yet once more you shake the earth and you declare, the silver is mine and the gold is mine and I will fill my temple with my glory. We thank you, Father. We are privileged to be given this end time message. We are privileged to be those mandated to hold it fast and true. We are privileged to be those that you chose, that you are invested in us, to be custodians of this divine revelation of this end time move. Guide and bless each one here and mark all those who are here according to their ability and mark all those who are online hearing this word and raise the 7,000 strong to stand. Let not Elijah stand alone, but raise the 7,000 to stand strong and firm to identify with this move. Thank you, Father God. Mark every one of them. Mark all the 7,000 strong. Mark them to be part of those who handle the wealth for the Exodus. Thank you, Father, that your blessings be great and true. Seal the seal for the wheat and the oil. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering. And God bless each one of you. Amen.